at 535. Okay. At this time, the chair is seeking an adoption of the agenda as printed. So moved on Second. It's been moved and second to adopt the agenda as printed. Any discussion? All right. Um, Director Watchery. Aye. Director Brooks. Aye. Director Carter. Aye. Director Graves. Aye. Chair votes aye. Motion carries five to zero. At this time, we're moving to uh, item 3.0, board roles and superintendent, and we'd like to welcome Ms. Phyllis Barks back to the district. All right, great. Is it, am I on? Okay. All right. Yes, yes. Um, and so I've kind of made the rounds, but I do want to give you an opportunity to quickly introduce yourself. So uh, I'm Phyllis Barks from Missouri School Boards Association, and I'm just delighted to be back with you. Um, I feel very welcome here, so thank you so much. Um, and we'll, we'll, I just, um, you can, let's take a minute, go around the table, just introduce yourself. I know most of you, um, but also just those of you who have been on the board and been through the superintendent evaluation process, if there's something that you felt like has worked well this past year, if you would quick, you know, just briefly share that. Or if, particularly if there was something you found challenging about the process, then um, that will be helpful to me in uh, continuing to provide some support for this year's process and make sure that we try to address that and help you through that. So I'm gonna just start here with Ms. Johnson. <laughs> Carla Fields Johnson with Fields and Brown, um, new counsel to the district. Cecil Watry, um, board director. Waukesha Briggs, board chair. Carol Grace, board member. Tremise Carter, board director. Al Brooks, board of director. Yolanda Cargill, superintendent. Is this where we were also also supposed to share what worked well and challenges. Sure. Uh, I'd offer that the training you facilitating this session uh, was a plus for the board and myself to, to have someone to facilitate the conversation to make sure that we were aligned with Missouri statutes in terms of evaluating the superintendent. One item that really that sticks with me the most in terms of a challenge was the initial uh, feedback that I received from the board in terms of not being a consensus from uh, the board in terms of uh, one rating for each one of the indicators. I received kind of multiple numbers so if we could really work towards a consensus in terms of that feedback. We finally got there, but it was a process to get there. And so that posed a challenge because I didn't know what, Really, you know, there were split numbers where three people may have said this or two people said this, and so reaching a consensus in terms of feedback for me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Also, in addition to what uh, Dr. Carlisle said, there was there was concern as to when the evaluation took place, and there was those who, who after Dr. Cargill uh, evaluated herself then there was an area that there was disagreement on whether or not uh, she met that, that particular uh, requirement or, or not. And then there was the, the discussion over whether or not uh, we ought to wait till the uh, APR scores come in to evaluate. So which means that, and I don't know, is there a certain time within the fiscal year, the calendar year, that the evaluation take place? But but I think we were behind in terms of when the evaluation was due. And it, it, it concerned me as to, as to um, now after the APR scores came in, then we ended up agreeing, I think maybe someone abstained, I'm not sure how that vote came down, uh, but um, um, I think it was approved at that time. And, and one final note, uh, I'd like to, Talk about if is it good policy to abstain? Now you certainly have a right under Robert's rules to do that, but I'm wondering is it is it good governance to to abstain on on, on important issues? That that's 
That's a concern of mine. I also want to take an opportunity. Okay. Yeah, it wasn't a comment. I was just letting you. And Mr. I, Brooks, what was the other thing you said related related to being off the timeline and not in the APR? Okay. And then um I find that hard to believe. <laughs> okay, Ms. Briggs. Yeah, I do want to acknowledge the fact that uh, Vice President Reagan is on um, the speaker phone. Okay. I think one of the things that will be helpful today as well is to remind the board that Dr. Cargow's evaluation cycle was, uh, was it 16 or 18? 18 months. It was uh -huh. an 18-month cycle. Right. So we would have already received those scores at that time. Because it was December, was that, what was that? It was just here. We, but because Desi had some, there were some things going on with the, right, right. that were out of the district's control. Right. I mean, so there were some, some yes. variables that uh, were taking place that were outside of the district con control. And so sure. just to remind the board that that uh, was what we were dealing with at the same time and remind the board that uh, this was the first year um, for the scoring for this test. Okay. That would be helpful. Great. Anybody else? Um, all right. uh, Vice President Reagan. Yeah, I'm here. Um, do you have any questions uh, regarding uh, reflecting on last year or anything that uh, you'd like to discuss within this training? I'm going to listen and then I'll get back in. I, I, I kind of blurred out. That's why I just got a chance on the... Uh, you just recall. Right? Yeah, I just recall what happened last week. So, uh, Mr. Reagan, this is Ms. Phyllis Barks from MSBA, and I was just, we were just doing inter quick introductions. And I just ask for those who participated in the evaluation process last year, if there were any uh, areas that you felt worked well, or particularly were there areas you felt that was challenging with the process? Uh, no bail, uh, no bail. Okay, thank you. Can you mute your phone, Mr. Reagan? Say what now? Just mute your phone until you. Okay, so uh, just real quickly, we'll try to address these, but um, I, yeah, it is the board's evaluation, and so they're, they're, we do have to come to at least a quorum agreement, um, and everybody needs to participate in that. Everybody gets a voice, but uh, ultimately then the rating and the final feedback is around that consensus or, or a quorum agreement at least, and we'll, we'll get to that point. Um, yeah, there are challenges with uh, when we're using DESE data um, and held hostage to that. And so one of the things as we talk later this evening about what are the evidence, what is the data that you'll want to use to help you assess performance this year, um, we'll be looking at what are some other indicators and not just APR. So how will we know? Because that's only once a year. And, and after the fact. And so what are those measures, what information might be helpful throughout the year so that we know if we're making progress and moving in that direction. And then I, I, to just to talk about briefly about abstain, and, and I think that's an issue you wanna also address with Ms. Johnson. But from our perspective, um, 
uh, uh, the primary reason you abst for an abstention is uh, to avoid nepotism and conflict of interest. And that, you know, by taking the oath to be a board member, you're saying that I'm committing to this work. And so, um, you know, occasionally in the beginning, maybe some new board members may not feel well informed about budget. You know, you get elected right away in, in, in the spring, and then right away you're approving a budget for the next year, and you don't know anything about the budget development. Or maybe some really big decision that had a lot of background information. But um, to abstain just because you don't want to weigh in on an issue um, is, in essence, really not taking your responsibility. Um, so we would really encourage board members to, you know, consider all the information and vote and participate um, so that it is the board, the entire board, that's really making those decisions. But, it's not, you know, it's challenging. You do have that right. It's not against the law or anything, as far as I'm <laughs> understanding, uh, but just good boardmanship. We would encourage you to do that. All right, great. So um, if you, we have duplication, and that's, uh, I, I apologize if my communication wasn't clear that I was bringing copies, and so you probably have two sets of handouts. But if you don't mind, we'll work from mine because they're in the order that we're going to be using them in, and, and I'm, the others may be too, but and they sh they're probably a, just a duplication of everything. So we'll start on the left side. And um, just to kind of add, you know, let's add a little levity here to uh, this heavy topic. And uh, so I like this little cartoon, and, and they're out here on the ledge and having this little conversation that says, you're out here because you're supposed to receive a performance evaluation. I'm out here because I have to give the evaluation. So it really kind of just captures that a performance evaluation is something that most of us would rather avoid, where um, we kind of dread it. We get a little uncomfortable with it sometimes. And um, we'll look at you know what some of those those challenges are, but whether you're being evaluated or the one that's that's giving that feedback, sometimes we we kind of are reluctant to do that, and uh, we'll we'll look at trying to help navigate that so it's a bit more of a comfortable process. So some of those factors that that um, and this is you know probably any profession there's some reluctance to do performance evaluation. These are um, this these kind of factors are based on a couple of articles that focused on school board evaluation of the superintendent. And so um, most many board members do not come from an education background. Some board members do, not all. And so coming from different walks of life may not be knowledgeable about what is a superintendent's responsibilities, how do we evaluate a superintendent because we're not in the district every day, we don't see what's actually happening, and so it's challenging from that perspective and sometimes we avoid doing those things. A lot of times there's not the, the conversation that we're going to have tonight and that you had last year about agreement on what we're going to evaluate. And so that lends itself to some challenges. Sometimes the people doing the evaluation, we have a tendency sometimes, especially when we haven't defined what we're going to evaluate, it's easy to focus on personal characteristics or maybe an event that just recently happened um, that's most prevalent in our mind, rather than what are those practices that are happening that are uh, focused on, on what we want to achieve. Then, um, you know, the evaluation, when it's done well, is viewed as this is just one more thing we have to do. It's time consuming. Rather than looking at evaluation as just one piece of all the things we're doing to improve our school district. And connecting it to what is it we're trying to achieve for Hickman Mills and how does the uh, evaluation process help us to get there. And so putting it in that context. And then uh, when, we, when those other factors are come into play where we maybe haven't talked about uh, boards that, do, that don't talk about what they're measuring and don't think about this as a process, um, kind of get blindsided. It's like somebody, the board secretary or the president or the superintendent realizes, oh my gosh, we have to have the evaluation done next month. 
And so there's that sense of urgency. And, and um, so the, the work that you're doing here tonight really helps you avoid these challenges. And so I you know, commend you for spending some time this evening to have this conversation. Important responsibility. Okay, so we're gonna look at what's your role. Let's just background because you have some new members, <laughs> you have some veterans. We wanna make sure that everybody's on the same page with why is this your responsibility and, and where does that fit within your governance work? And then we'll work on uh, focusing on what will the evaluation be focused on this year? We can't measure everything in this process, but we're gonna focus. And then what are some of the evidence pieces, the data, the information that will help you to assess that and for Dr. Cargyle to be sharing with you? And then, um, whoop, it kind of zip, I zipped along. And then we'll look at an updated timeline uh, for you to review and kind of consider if that meets your needs uh, for this process. Okay? So um, on the, to put this into context, evaluation is just one of the important tasks that you do as governance leaders for your district. And we have, there is research about what do effective boards do. And um, there are four major research pieces that we kind of often refer to, and they have these common practices that effective boards demonstrate. There's a clear focus on student learning that's pervasive throughout their work. They've articulated what they want to achieve for their students and they um, are on a path to get there and all their work aligns to that. Um, demonstrating ethical and legal behaviors, that's following laws and, and uh, those kinds of things. Using your policies, um, being respectful and collaborative with each other and with the superintendent and with your um, community. Delegating operational decisions to the superintendent. So we articulate what is we want to accomplish and we make sure we have good policies and then we allow the superintendent to get that work done and figure out how to do it. But at the same time, you have to, you trust her leadership, but then you verify through monitoring and measuring. How are we doing? And then um, two-way keeping your stakeholders informed and, and inviting stakeholders to give input into what they want the district, where they want the district to go, and the having that ongoing conversation. And then lastly, effective boards are doing what you're doing this evening, have ongoing learning and professional development. So where do these pieces fit for superintendent evaluation? These in particular, relate to this process in that what you decide to measure is ultimately around what you want to achieve for your students. It is um, demonstrating because your work, your, it's evaluation isn't something we do to the superintendent, but with the superintendent to help her learn and grow and be an effective leader for Hickman Mills. So we collaborate to do that. This is that trust but verify part. So we're, we trust you to, to provide the leadership, um, but we're going to be reflecting on how well you're doing that. Is it getting us the results that we want? Are we moving in the right direction? And this is part of that, just one piece of how you monitor district performance. So important part of your overall governance work. Okay, you all can jump in anytime. I don't have to do all the talking, and you will be doing more of the talking coming down, but you can interrupt at any time. So we're just to kind of look at every, where all this work takes place, and it's just kind of fam probably familiar to a number of you. But leadership occurs at every level in your district. Everybody needs to be a leader. There's a responsibility for everyone to step up and lead. You are in a very unique position in that you have that governance leadership, big picture, 50,000 foot view. Nobody else in the district has that responsibility. You have to be able to look at all over the entire district, all students, what's best for the, the district. And be strategic about what are we trying to accomplish? What do we need to focus on? 
the superintendent and her cabinet and the building principals then are also are providing that tactical focus in terms of how do we get this done? What are the plans, the strategies, the day-to-day -day operations that need to occur to achieve that? And they need to provide that leadership and focus on that role. Your teachers then are down at that operational level, very close up. And the decisions that you make up here in the, uh, at the strategic level, 50,000 foot view, affects what happens in the classroom. But we should all be working toward the same thing. And the things that are happening in the, happening in the classroom, you know, those teachers need that close up view because they've got to make decisions about every student in the class on a day to day basis. And sometimes when they come to you, that's what they're focused on, what's happening in their classroom. They don't understand and they don't have all the information you have at that big picture district view um, that you're uniquely qualified to do. But what happens in that classroom level percolates up and has, is provides some evidence as to the leadership that's occurring in central office and in the boardroom. How effective are those decisions in helping guide the work of your staff? I think one of the things, Phyllis, before you go any further sure. uh, in this discussion is that that governance level, you know, uh, in my opinion, sometimes, um, in my observation, I find that sometimes a, some board members kind of play around down there on the administrative level, you know, in a, the blue. And the reason why the evidence, as you would say, is because some of the stuff is percolating from the community up back up to the, the governance levels, which requires for board members to kind of like, oh, so is this evidence, is this conversation that we're receiving, this feedback we may be receiving from, you know, the 10,000 foot view versus the close up view. So sometimes, as in any business, there's this, there is, um, um, how can I say, discrepancies in the evidence. That's, that's yeah. But because the discrepancy might not be that, that it's different information, it's just that they have this mm -hmm. close-up information. They don't have all the information for the big picture. And while you certainly want to listen to those individual comments and feedback and say thank you for sharing that, if it's a concern, here's who you need to talk mm -hmm. to that's going to be able the closest to be able to fix it. responsive and listen to our stakeholders, you have to let your other staff fix it and address it. And, and it can be questions about, uh, and board level questions, if they're, you're providing this information, but we're, we're getting um, a lot of questions or comments, can we talk about the difference? Why, why are we, is this inconsistent? It seems inconsistent, okay? So we ask those quite open questions Yeah, I just, want, I just wanted you to just yeah, it's, paint that picture. It's a, it's a common, common mm -hmm. challenge for board members because you're accustomed to taking on and doing and fixing uh, in your daily lives, in our personal lives, in our work lives. We're in charge of doing things. And here you're delegating that to be done. Okay. So. Another way of just looking at what's your role, that where is governance? Where am I, where is this taken? Do you know what this view is? Where, where is it from? It looks like the union station from the mall, but I'm not sure. That's, that's the tower, uh, the World War I Museum. That's right, yeah. The top, taken from atop the Liberty right. Museum. And so why is this, this just kind of represents what's the board 
Oh, it's okay. Um, because uh, it's a bird's eye view of of everything, but it also it puts us so far away that we don't see the intricate details of what um, essentially the we don't see the gears. We just see the machine itself. Exactly. That and that's where we you and nobody else has that job. So if you're not focusing there, who is? Okay, so that's why you need to keep that big view, and that's the view you need to take as we look at superintendent evaluation and what are the evidence pieces that we'll be talking about this evening. So why is this the superintendent's view? Still, still around the Liberty Memorial, but a little closer up. Closer to the ground, closer to the work, having a closer view and being able to interact with staff and engage in, in the conversation to share what the goals are and what the work should entail. Right, still have to have that big picture, look at the whole district, but be able to quickly respond and direct uh, staff in, in, uh, in the day to day. And so lastly, uh, we're inside the museum now. Um, and why would you say that's the teacher's view? That's within the building. I'm sorry. That's within the building. That's all the intricate details, uh, the information. That's where the work is being done. Right. So every every aspect of that leadership has a role and a responsibility. Hello, oh, Mr. Reagan. How you doing, Ms. Good. Good. Nice to see you. So kind of knowing what, where your work takes place and just thinking about that and that um, superintendent evaluation is one of your uh, responsibilities, why, what's the purpose? Why do, you, why do you do superintendent evaluation? Why is that the board, a board's responsibility? I think it helps uh, evaluate the what where the district is headed as far as uh, what we have accomplished through all the planning and through all the things that the superintendent and her leadership has brought to us. Anybody else? It's the middle ground. Sorry. It's the middle ground. It's the it's where you meet um, in the middle. The her. The superintendent's purpose uh, connects the the ground to the sky view, so it acts as a vehicle to um, assist us with knowing what, like tagging on to what Mr. Reagan said, um, being able to evaluate what's being done at the ground level, what's working and what's not working. Anything else? Here's my quiet end of the table. Why, why do you think, Ms. Carter? Why do you think we evaluate a superintendent? What's the purpose? Why do we do evaluation? Other than our policy says we need to. We want to make sure that she's actually, she's in the right direction in leadership. And if we have to go back and maybe change things or go back and make corrections or fix like now, like say for instance, if she was getting evaluated and we seen something wasn't effective. We, we have that opportunity to go back and help her and see what we can do on our end to make sure that we can change things to make it effective. Okay, you're not off the hook, you know. <laughs> so uh, ultimately, one of the purposes really is ultimately to improve the performance of your students because that's why we're all here. And so um, evaluation is just part of that process to say, how are our students doing? And are we achieving what we want to achieve for our students? So ultimately, everything we should be doing is focused on that outcome. And as you said, it's to improve her skills as a leader, to help her get better, to strengthen and, and grow her profession. 
And it, you talked about it being a bridge, and that's indeed correct. It's it's a bridge between the operations and the governance. It's a communication opportunity, and it helps to build your relationship. If you're helping her grow and improve her, her professional skills as a leader, that will help your district. It, and as Ms. Carter pointed out, if through that process, if there are things that maybe aren't um, being as effective uh, as you would hope, then it gives you an opportunity to reflect on are there governance actions that we need to take that will help strengthen that, that will give her the support she needs to be able to achieve those things. So it is about strengthening your relationship. It does fulfill a policy requirement, which I didn't put in your packet, but just to, um, a couple copies for you all to share is that this does tell you about the process that you've agreed to and, and what some of the requirements are. So it is policy driven. And then it is one of the ways that you are being accountable to your district and your stakeholders by saying we are checking in to see how things are going. It's one of the tools we use to, to find out how is Hickman Mills performing. And lastly, uh, but importantly, um, the results of the evaluation process should all be part of the information that you use to make contract and employment decisions. And so we want that to be in, based on data, on evidence, and um, that we can support those decisions around that. So lots of reasons why this is an important process to focus on. So when we, to kind of reduce the dread, okay, we identified, you know, what are some of those things that cause dread, then th to reduce that, to make it more of a, um, uh, would be hard to say enjoyable probably, <laughs> uh, but to make it um, you more comfortable and it to be more effective for the board and for Dr. Cargyle to think about is, Shifting from that event to a process, and I know this past um, year and a half, this was the first time in using this tool and this process, and so it's a little bumpy along the way, not uncommon. And, and so, um, you know, what did you learn from that and how can we make that better this time? We can help also by focusing on what does the research say that effective leaders do? that get results for students, research-based kind of practices or standards. The other thing that helps make it more meaningful is when we align it with what are we focused on as a district? What is it we're trying to achieve? Because this is not an add-on, this is one piece of those kind, what you're trying to achieve. The other thing is, is to have forms that are easy for you to use. So, I know that you used, I think, what was in the, the DESI guide, that, and that's fine. Um, but if you find that you need to tweak those to make them a little more user-friendly, certainly um, uh, that will help, it, help the process move along more smoothly. I have a comment at that section. Um, one of the things that I noticed during Dr. Cargill's evaluation, the um, evaluation mechanisms that you provide in the MSBA were very different than some of the districts that um, I researched. I don't have the districts in front of me. And so which led me to kind of think, was this the best tool for the district? And it's my own professional opinion because I did research it uh, and looked at some of the summative and qualitative reports. And ours was really pretty, actually pretty vague based on um, some of the other indicators and goals set in other districts. So I hope that as we work through this process that we, if, if not this mechanism, then, then what? Yeah, sure. Um, well, that's certainly uh, the team's decision as to what forms. Um, we, you know, there are components that are helpful to have, but how you organize them and what that looks like, and if you have additional information, that's certainly fine, and one that you all should kind of reflect on and make those decisions as a team. And I'll be glad to, you know, help you through that if you want. I don't know that, you know, so you can, I'm happy for you to share some examples and we can explore those and look at, do they have the components that kind of need to follow the process? And, and you all can then have that discussion, yeah.
Great. Okay. And the last thing that kind of helps reduce dread and to improve the, pro the quality of the process is what you're doing tonight. Again, periodic training. And because it is the board's evaluation. It isn't seven individual evaluations. And you've got members that are coming on that are new to the process. And so um, we want to be able to be consistent and uh, be able to come together on, on our feedback for Dr. Cargyle. All right. So when we do these things, um, shifting to a process, identifying what we're going to measure, talking about it throughout the year, using evidence, then we avoid this, that sense of urgency. Your evaluation is based on the next 30 seconds. Go. You know, sometimes that's what happens. You get, you, somebody realizes, oh my gosh, we haven't done it. Here's a form, fill it out, bring it to the next meeting. We're going to do this. And, and not being thoughtful about it. And so um, we, we want to try to avoid that and be planful. All right. So a, a, big, a bit of a sense of just the context in your role so that we're kind of all on the same page. Um, so now let's move into um, the meat of uh, looking at what will be measured this year. Okay. So an, a lot of things. So again, looking at the process, it's a circle. It doesn't end. We continue. Uh, it's a continuous process. Improvement is continuous. Um, but we begin with identifying what will be measured. As we did the last time, um, you know, everyone gets input. And it's a little different because you've had an, some experience now and you've had some indicators and you have some evidence and data. Once we determine what will be measured, then how will we measure it? What kind of information, evidence, documentation, artifacts will you expect from Dr. Cargyle? What, what are some things that she knows that's happening in the district that would be data that would feed into this kind of thing? And then, um, again, determining what's the baseline, starting point of performance. We can't measure improvement if we don't know where we're starting from. Okay. We'll talk about um, then, uh, based on baseline performance, she'll develop a growth plan for how she's going to address, um, get, achieve those things and move to the next level. And uh, thinking about how frequently you're going to get updates and provide some feedback for those interim um, or formative conversations. And then ultimately, uh, that those would inform your summative overall evaluation for the year. And then you begin the cycle all over again. So um, we'll start with identifying what will be measured and some data to look at. OK. Um, so as before, just a reminder for those folks who are new, again, it's a, it's a collaborative process. Superintendent should have input, and uh, board should have input. And we want to focus on no more than two or three areas. That allows us to go deeper and have more meaningful uh, conversations and focused for improvement. She's still responsible for everything in your strategic plan, from running the entire district, for making sure everything's, uh, you know, the buildings are maintained, all of that. But you're just measuring for the purposes of evaluation two or three focused areas. Okay, we want to look at um, how does it relate to what you want to accomplish for your students and the district? What will help her grow as a leader? And um, aligned with your strategic priorities and the board's priorities. And we'll look at all of that information in just a moment. Okay, in your packet, um, I think it's still on the left side. We have a blue, it's a blue sheet of paper. It is the Missouri Superintendent Standards and Indicators. So you remember, one of the requirements is that we, um, we want to be focused on what the research says, effective superintendents, what their skills are, and what are the practices that they demonstrate. 
And so these Missouri standards and quality indicators are based on research. They do uh, describe what broadly what effective superintendents do that have a positive impact on students' learning and district improvement. And so just to re-familiarize yourself with those um, 16 quality indicators, we'll be, using, we'll be referencing those this evening. And then um, to make it focused on your district specifically, we'll want to consider your draft strategic plan, those focus areas, and you have a copy of that also. I believe it's on the left side. <clears throat> you have a number of focus areas in your draft strategic plan. And where, where are you in that process? We just got it. We just got it. You just got, you've, and you just approved it. Okay. All right. Well, good. I'm glad I put it in the packet. <laughs> All right. So we'll be referencing uh, the strategic plan. And then uh, as you, uh, those of you who are, were on the board, um, are not new to the board, uh, know that these were the three indicators that were focused on in last cycle's evaluation. 1.2, implementing the vision, mission, and goals is the standard and or the indicator that was focused on. And you particularly, in your local context, were focused on uh, moving toward accreditation and engagement of stakeholders and communication. You focused on indicator 3.1, managing the organizational structure to focus on equity, effective learning environment, adequate funding and allocation of resources and quality staff. That's a whole lot to put under one little indicator. <laughs> and then 4.1, collaborate with families and other community members, focusing on attendance and uh, student staff and community engagement. The next piece of information that we'll be looking at is the actual ratings, uh, the summative ratings of the board on um, Dr. Cargill on these uh, indicators. And this is the point at which you have the ability to um, adjourn to closed session since we'll be looking at specific performance. So Madam Chairman, I'll leave that to you and, and, and that decision if you want to do that. Were you ready to go into closed session? Mm-hmm. Because for those, um, is that on? The, are those exceptions on the agenda? Well, the agenda's on a stack of paper. Have. You, you have yours uh, readily available, Cecil. I don't. Yes. Yes. Okay. It's not in the. It's out of. It's. It's in the. It's as item seven, but it's. This is the juncture where that would be appropriate as we're talking about performance. At this time, I at this time we will adjourn the meeting at six nineteen to go into closed session. I think you just need a motion. A motion. Madam President, I'll make a motion that we uh, go into closed session three, what is it, two point yes. six point six point one zero O two one three and thirteen RSMO. I second. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Vice President Reagan. Aye. Director Watry. Aye. Director Brooks. Aye. Director Carter. Aye. Director Graves. Chair votes aye. Motion carries six to zero. Okay.